the digital era where, where social media has made it uh, easier for us to connect with the world from wherever it is that we are and at any time. I mean, think about it. Uh, it's interesting that even as Waidera has talked about the Kenyatta National Hospital uh, uh, situation, you know, or the allegations, the thing is that uh, you are able to follow up with this or follow through with this conversation because of social media. Some of us, had we not seen it on news or, or maybe we met someone who's been afflicted by this, uh, we will not know this. But social media has made it so easy for us to connect with anything that is happening across the world. You know, something as recent as the, the US federal government shutdown uh, yesterday. You know, it, it's interesting that you can follow the proceedings of the US Senate in the Capitol building in Washington DC real time. You know, you can follow <laughs> the, the, the nuclear launches in North Korea. Uh, you can follow what's happening in Australia. Uh, in, in, in Name any country, you know, whether it's Fiji, whether it's Chile, whether it's Germany. We can follow what's happening real time and you'll know what people are happening. You, know, you just need to name a country right now and you go on social media, you go on internet and you can find out uh, details about uh, that particular country. We connect with people that we have never met. And somehow we have great relationships, or so we think. You know, uh, 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 it's interesting that you find, I've found people who've told me that they are dating someone that they've never met physically, but they've been dating for almost two years, but because they met Facebook. I don't know whether of you, any of you came across the couple, in, the Nigerian couple that, that got married seven days after they met on Facebook. There, it's there on Facebook, it's there on social media. I mean, it's interesting, relationships have entered a completely new dynamic that did not exist 15 years ago. We, 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 we never used to connect the same way we are connecting uh, right now on social media. Um, friends, fans, and, and haters, they, they, they follow you. And they, they can be able to tell what's happening in your life. They can tell what you ate last night. They can tell where your rural home is. They can tell, you know, where you slept last week. Also because you are sharing your life with us. Thank you. They can tell, you know, we can tell which country you are in during the holidays. And thank you very much for giving us this information. People know every day we find that we are following people, but we are also being followed. If I, 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 it begs the question, why do we follow people on social media? Those of us who are, are, are on, which, which forms the majority? If you don't follow people on social media, that's okay. Just indulge with the people around you. Why do you follow people on social media? Or why do you think people follow you? Maybe you don't follow guys, people just follow you, you know. Uh, you're, you're famous. Uh, uh, but why do, you, why, why do we follow people on social media? The thing is, you know, all those things that we've talked about, I want to believe that many of us follow people because of one, who they are. We aspire these people and, and, and uh, for, for who they are. Uh, but most importantly, and I do believe we can agree on this, what we can get from them. I mean, common interest. You know, uh, we talked about funny videos. We just want humor. You know, you, know, you follow these people because they are always uh, tweeting funny things or funny videos, uh, uh, or they are always tweeting intelligent things, uh, and you want to follow them. You know, many of us will follow some of the richest people. You know, some of us will follow someone like Jeff Bezos, because you want to understand from the richest man in the world, you know, you want to see if you can get some nuggets of how you can become rich. <laughs> okay? It's like, you know, you're, that, that thing will make you become rich. But the thing is that I don't know him, he doesn't know me. I know of him, but you know what? I can be able to learn a few things from him. Some of us will follow someone like Uhuru Kenyatta, uh, 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 our president. Why? Because you want to know what he's doing in our country. You know, now that Twitter has become the place where uh, 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 presidents issue decrees and, and, and commands, you know? Uh, uh, so you want to follow and find out, you know, what is this person doing for my country? So it's about what we can be able to get uh, out of these people. Some of us even follow influential people because we want to understand what is their opinion about certain things in society. You know, uh, 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 some of us are very, mo in fact, most of us are familiar with Biko Zulu. One of the, in fact, right now he's become a very famous guy in the city. Every other middle class is reading his articles. You know, and you want to find out some influential people like this, sports personalities, you know, uh, 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 entertainment personalities, uh, uh, media personalities. We want to find out what's their opinion about certain things. Some of you are looking at me like, who's Biko Zulu? And we all follow these people, not necessarily because we have a relationship with them, but because they have something that we want or something that can benefit us. And the reality 
is that this also happens when it comes to our relationship with Jesus. Many of us follow him, not because we have a relationship with him, but because of what we can get from him. He's a God of miracles. So because he's going to give me a job, because he's the one who's going to heal me, because he will give me a child when I pray, then I will follow him. And many times we treat our relationship with Jesus this way, where it's all about what we can get from him. But is that how it should be? Is this what Jesus expects of us? While the answer to that might be an obvious no, I, I, I want to believe and, and, and that many of us, probably many of us here, do not really understand the terms and conditions of that no. We don't really understand what does it mean you know, for us to have a, a good relationship, a two-way relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, for those who are joining this conversation for the very first time, we are going through a series titled, I Follow. And through this series, we are trying to answer the question, what does it really mean to follow Jesus? I mean, uh, 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 millions of Christians gather in spaces like this every Sunday. And, and, and they're in spaces of worship even during the week. But we don't really understand what does it really mean for you and I to follow Jesus? What does it mean for us to live that life of a Christian? You know, uh, uh, and this is what we see in our world today. The first week we began by saying, you know, uh, the, the, the first step of following Jesus is that he has opened up an invitation to everyone. Anybody can come into this relationship with Jesus. And we say, come as you are. We looked at the story of Matthew, a guy who was despised in society. You know, his, his class was not one of those that was uh, like because he was a tax collector. But we find Jesus invites him, and not only that, he also invites other tax collectors and other sinners to come and dine with him. And we found that, you know what? Yeah, he says, come as you are, because he came for people like those. Then the last week, we, we talked about, you know, now that you've come, then take the next steps. What are the next steps? Because this, this uh, our journey with, with Christ is one about just taking little uh, uh, steps, baby steps towards becoming the kind of people that God wants us to be. And we look at the story of Peter and, and, and how, you know, during that event when they were called by the Sea of Galilee, and, and we mentioned some of the steps. We talked about the step of information. We talked about the step of inconvenience. Some of us are in the place where you are learning, and we're saying it's okay. Listen out. Learn. You know, what is God saying uh, about your situation, about your season? Some of us are in a place of inconvenience. God is asking you to do something that is probably not very convenient for you at this particular moment. Then we moved on to the uh, step of invitation where some of us need to start inviting God into every area of our lives. Are there things that are happening? Maybe it's your workspace. Maybe it's your relationship. Maybe it's your family. And you need to invite God into those spaces. But we also talked about the step of surrender. That ultimately, what we need to do is that when we get to that place where we connect with God, where God, you know, Jesus is, is, is in his revealed state to us, then we do surrender. I want us to move on to the next, to the third installment. And you see, when it comes to following Jesus, it could be, that we don't really understand that there are terms and conditions that apply. And, and maybe you're sitting there and you're thinking, yeah, but pastor, you just said that we need to come as we are. I thought you said that there are no prerequisites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said that. You see, at the beginning of your, uh, your relationship with Jesus, the invitation is open to everyone. In fact, I said the prerequisite for you to be, to be a follower of Jesus is that you're a sinner. That's the only, prerequis that's the only qualification. You're a sinner. You've qualified. In fact, with flying colors. But the thing is, for you to remain a follower of Jesus, there is an expectation that Christ has over each and every one of us. And allow me to, say, to sort of uh, share this in just a few minutes. Because today I want to uh, uh, share from the book of Mark, from the gospel of Mark. Now, we've, we've read from the, from the gospel of Matthew, uh, uh, from the gospel of Mark, uh, Luke, and now we're going to do the gospel of uh, Mark. And I said, you know, this is what makes the story of Jesus so amazingly beautiful. Because four different people, they write the story about this one individual, and these stories complement each other. And what an amazing story it is of Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, Jesus Christ, we know we've seen uh, in the past couple of weeks, he's been walking from town to town, call, uh, calling his followers, uh, uh, who now we know as the disciples, you know, uh, and, and he started with the, the, the 12 who will be closest to him. And, 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 and now we've met uh, uh, some of the disciples that we've met. We've met Matthew. Who else have we met? Peter. We've met John. 
We've met James and we've met Andrew. Now, at least you know five. If you don't know the rest, at least now you know five of the dis- disciples. And Jesus now is becoming more and more famous. It is evident that everywhere this guy is going, you know, uh, uh, that there are multitudes of people who are following him. There are people who are following him everywhere. And, 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 and maybe it is because of the great things that are happening around him. I mean, miracles are happening. People are getting healed. Thousands are getting fed. And it is because of this. This guy is literally trending in this season of his life. And more and more people are following him, thousands. And in one of those days, he was having a very interesting conversation with one of his disciples. In fact, the, the, the entire group of his disciples. And, and, and this begins to define for us, you know, what the expectation Christ has of each and every one of us, especially those of us who want to be his true followers. And we find this in the book of Mark from chapter 8. And from chapter 8, it says this, that Jesus and his disciples... If someone can correct this uh, uh, projector for me, the screen looks a bit crooked. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea, uh, uh, Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? Now, Caesarea, Philippi is one of those pagan cities uh, uh, that was controlled by the Roman uh, government. So this is a very important question that Jesus is asking to his disciples in this space. He's like, who do people say that I am? I mean, you guys have been with me for a while, uh, uh, you, you, you've seen the things that have happened, uh, and, and maybe you're even in the space where you've heard what people have said. So, so who do people say that I am? And they replied, and they said this, some say John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist was a man who was preparing the way for Jesus Christ, and he kept on telling people, repent, repent, uh, because Jesus Christ is coming. Uh, but just before this, the guy had been beheaded. So the people were saying, you know, maybe, maybe it's, it's John the Baptist who has come back to life. Others say Elijah. Now, Elijah was an Old Testament prophet. And, and, and Elijah ascended to heaven. And they're saying, maybe Elijah has come back. Still others said, you are one of the prophets. Now, they, they, they had seen the things that Jesus had done. But also, they had heard about the things that the prophets of the Old Testament had, they had done. And now they're thinking, you know what? There's some similarities here. So you're probably one of the prophets. And then he continues and he say, but what about you? He asked, who do you say I am? It's like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's okay, that's what they say, but who do you say that I am? It is important that also for you, I want to hear, who do you say that I am? You see, and this is also important for you and I, because it is not just good for you to know what people say about Jesus, or what other people do about Jesus. It is also important for you to know who Jesus is. And Peter replied, okay? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Now, Here's something that you need to understand. And, and Peter was like the spokesperson of the disciples. You know, uh, Messiah meant Christ, which really meant the anointed one. The, the, the ancient Jewish people had been waiting for God to send his anointed one uh, uh, for so many years. And Peter was there for saying, you're the guy. You're the one that we've been waiting for a very long time. You're the one that we've been waiting for to take up the throne and hopefully deliver us from our enemies. So Jesus, you are the one. You're God's anointed one. And it seems like Peter was right because based on Jesus' response, this is what Jesus says, Jesus warns them. He warned them not to tell anyone about him. And I'm sure these guys must have been puzzled. They must have wondered, okay, if you are the guy that we've been waiting for a very long time to come and take up the throne, then shouldn't we be shouting from the rooftops that you are here? I mean, this is like the coolest thing, Jesus, and you're telling us to hush about it? So they must have been puzzled. But here's the thing that I want you to understand. The reason Jesus wants them not to tell anyone is that he must have known their hearts and their minds and that this guy still did not understand what it meant for him being the Messiah. For him to warn them and tell them, no, don't tell anyone. It's because he understood there were still some lessons. There were still some big things that they needed to learn about him being the Messiah and him being present at that particular time. Now, I want to tell you this. Because I'm leading to somewhere. I'm leading towards the expectation that Jesus Christ sets on you and I. But I want to sort of begin with the big picture. And Jesus sees an opportunity where he can begin to teach them about this big picture. We are told he then began to teach them that the son of man, look at those words, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And that he must 
be killed, and after three days, rise again. Now, here's the thing. Now that you know I am the Messiah, now that you know I'm the anointed one, let me bust your bubble. Let me bust your bubble. Because I must suffer. I must be rejected. The kind of life that you think the Messiah is going to live is probably not going to be so. And he speaks to these people and he begins to teach them, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to be rejected, and yes, I will get killed. And we see from this point forward that Jesus spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside. I mean, Peter was just a... Uh, in Kiswahili, we will say Kimbelembele. Because Peter took him aside and began to rebuke. Can you imagine rebuking your boss? You know, and Peter is like, hey, Jesus, you know, this we can't even have a conversation with. You know, let me, let me, let me take you aside. He's like, I, what's, what's that stuff that you're talking about? What, what is this getting killed kind of stuff that you're talking about? Have you, have you seen the crowd? Have you seen that everywhere we are going, there are crowds that are following up? Jesus, you're famous. And, and because you're famous, we're also famous. You know, and, 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 and you are the anointed one. You are the Messiah. And because you are the Messiah, then you are untouchable. And if anyone even dares lay a hand on you, we are going to protect you. So, so, so the Messiah, the anointed one, their, their, their way of life is not supposed to be suffering and, 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 and being killed and being rejected by the people. You will be accepted. So, so Jesus, kill this. Kill this stuff. Kill this negative talk. I can imagine that probably that's what Peter was saying to him. But then Jesus, when Jesus turned and looked at the disciples, he rebuked Peter. And he said, get behind me, Satan. This is a harsh, harsh rebuke. In fact, let me say it in Kiswahili. Nyondoke shetani. Jesus was harsh. And he said, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And that's a harsh statement. Imagine, first of all, Jesus is doing this publicly, publicly to the rest of the disciples. And let me explain what's going on here. Jesus, knowing very well what's in Peter's heart and mind, Peter, the reason I am rebuking you harshly is because you've just exposed something. You have exposed that you are not concerned about what's going to happen to me, you're more concerned about what's going to happen to you because of what might happen to me. Now, following me has its own perks and benefits. And, and I'm sure that, Peter, you've enjoyed following me. But it is clear, it is clear that in, you're in this for what you can be able to get out of it. You're in this for the results, you know, for the benefits. Because as long as everything is going your way, then you are in it. But when I begin to say that I'm going to suffer, I'm going to get killed, I'm going to get rejected, you don't want anything to do with that. You want to receive the glory of following me, but you don't want the persecution. And I ask, how many people here are like Peter? We want to receive the glory of following Jesus, but we don't want the persecution. That whenever it comes to our relationship with Jesus, we are in it only during the good times. But when we begin to encounter unanswered prayers, when you lose your job, when you are going through a rocky marriage, when you lose a loved one, you stop following Jesus. You feel like you're walking in the dark and you find it difficult to keep following Jesus. And just like the disciples, we see Jesus as the anointed one, as the Messiah who's meant to. You see, the disciples had believed up to this point that Jesus Christ was the king, king with a small K, who will come and take over the throne in, in, from the Roman government and deliver them from their enemies. They had not seen Jesus as the most high king, the king of kings. And even for many of us, we sit in the place where we begin to see Jesus as the one who's going to come and sort out all our problems. So we find it difficult to make a connection between the fact that Jesus as the king and us going through difficult times. And as a result, our faith becomes event-based. That when only things are going well is when we follow Jesus. When they are not going well, when your business is in the, 
dips and dumps. You know, when, you, when you're not getting someone to like you or even to propose to you, you're like, you know what, there's not a God. You know, I don't even want to follow this Jesus. And as a result, we trust in God only when things are going our way. And knowing this very well, knowing our hearts, knowing our minds, Jesus pushes this conversation even further. He's like, I don't even think you guys have gotten it yet. Let me even take it further. He sees an opportunity to help those around him. And, and, and if, if, you are, if I had lost you at some point, I want you to come back in because you can't miss this, what Jesus says next. And he says this in verse 34. Then he called. He called them. He called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple, let's say those words together, must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever, whoever wants to be my disciple, which means my true follower, must deny themselves. They are not following me because of the things that they can get from me. They are not following me because of the things that they can get through me. Not because I can give them a job. Not because I can give them a child. Not because I can bless them with a spouse. No, 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 no. Or because even they can become an influential person in society. Those are good things. And in fact, there are much better things that I can give you as you are my follower. I can make you even become a much better person. We can become better at loving, better at forgiving, better at being merciful to others. Yeah, those are good things and there are better things that you can get and benefit from me. But he says, if you really want to be my follower, from time to time, you are going to have to deny yourself. You are going to have to die to yourself. Now, some of us hear this and you go like, wah, deny myself. Hey, Jesus, that's where we part ways. Because I find it difficult to deny myself. But you do this all the time, guys. In fact, we are in the season where a majority of us deny ourselves the most. Every other person is going through a diet. Every other person is going through some form of exercise. Why do we do that? We are denying ourselves the things because we know what we want. Denying yourself is simply saying no to yourself. And that's what Jesus is saying to us. Some of us even did it this morning. You woke up and you had a craving for a sumptuous breakfast. But because, like Waidera, you are thinking about that figure size 8, you know. You are like, you know what? You took that sugarless cup of tea or coffee. And you are here and you are not dead. Some of us, you know, your, your, your body is craving for carbs, but you're like, you know what? I, I want a six-pack. Right now, you're trying to divide this, the one-pack into six. And, and, and you know it's killing you. Every day you wake up in the morning like, I really want, but you tell yourself no because of what you want, you want to achieve in the future. Some of us even, we get to the place where we deny ourselves sleep because we want to wake up early in the morning so that we can go and exercise or we can go and study because we want to become better at certain things. Every day we say to ourselves, here is something that I want, but I don't even think it's the right thing for me, but here is the best thing for me. I would rather keep away from these bad habits. I would rather keep away from these things that I know are not leading me to where I need to go because I have a goal. I know who I want to become. And instead, let me do what I know what is right. And Jesus is telling us that there are going to be seasons. There's going to be moments in your lives where we shall encounter the fox in the roads. Where you will be in that space, where in your relationship with him, where what Jesus wants for you and what you want for you is different. You will encounter those moments in your life. It is in that moment that you have to decide if you're going to be the one who just enjoys this ride for the sake of the good things or you're going to be a true follower of Jesus. You're going to have to say no to yourself to follow him. Friends, we must lose our self-centered determination to control our lives. That's what Jesus is saying. And, and the lesson that I want you to take out with you here today is that following Jesus will cost you self. There's no way, there's no way that you can continue feeding yourself, that you can continue ruling your life and commanding your life, controlling your life and still expect that you're going to be a, a, a true follower of Jesus because at one point, those two will collide. Yourself, you're going to have to give it up. And we, we need, we must lose that self-centered determination that we have. 
And, and, and let me give you a few examples. You see, the thing is that your self-desire to engage in this addiction, whether it's alcohol, whether uh, it is sex, whatever it is you know that you want to engage in, uh, uh, pornography, you, you, you will get to that fork in the road and you'll know that this is what my body is telling me that I need to do. But you know what Jesus requires of you. You know what Jesus wants you to do. And you have to deny yourself. Yeah, I know. I know that your colleague is as hot as they come. And you've been having this desire uh, to sleep with them. But you know very well that God desires for you to live a life of sexual purity. And you're going to have to deny yourself and say no because you know what Jesus requires of you. Yes, I know that deal is slipping away. And, and you know very well that if you go that deal, it will sort out all your debt. But you know that they require for you to pay a bribe or a kickback or whatever it is that you want to call it. And you know very well that Jesus Christ will require for you to obey the law and not engage in any illegal affairs. So, so when you get to that fork in the road, you know that this is what yourself is telling you, but you know what is right. You know what Jesus is asking you to do. Yes, your spouse has driven you up 10 walls. You are angry. In fact, the only thing that is in your mind right now is that you want to leave. You want to divorce them. You want to leave them. But you made a vow and you know that Jesus, God hates divorce. And because of that, because of what Jesus wants for you, and it is different from what you want, then you'll have to sit there and stick it out and solve the issues in your marriage. You will have to deny yourself. Following Jesus will cost you self. You can't continue as you are and expect that you'll be a true follower of Jesus because one day they will collide. But that's not it. In fact, he continues. Check this out. This is what he says in verse 35. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. In fact, he's saying, the reality is that this. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how hard we work to get our prestigious uh, 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 positions, possessions, and power. It, it, it doesn't matter. We're going to lose all of that anyway. Right? It will come to an end one day. It doesn't matter how many diets you are on. It doesn't matter how hard you work to get that killer body. It doesn't matter how hard you work to make sure that that relationship works. One day, you will lose all of that. And it is not because your life is useless. But, whosoever, you can just go to the next verse. Whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Let me not lose you here. Please understand what I'm trying to say here. That is, whoever chooses to follow me and in the process of following me, they lose their prestigious position, their prestigious power or, or possessions, something of value that they're going to lose anyway, okay? Lose a relationship that is going to end anyway. Lose anything that they will say that this is life. Jesus says anyone, anyone who loses what they consider life, whatever it is that you call life. Lose that opportunity, lose that relationship, whatever it is that you call life. Jesus is saying, if you lose this, but if you lose it for Jesus, because you're going to lose it anyway, you're saving it. Let me say it in other words. What seems like a loss is not a loss. I'm giving you an opportunity to lose it with a purpose and a meaning. Whatever it is that you're working towards, it will come to an end one day. Your riches, your body, your life will come to an end one day. But I want to give you an opportunity to lose it with a purpose and a meaning. Verse 36 says this before I continue. What is good for someone, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul. In fact, verse 37. Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Now, we all have dreams and desires, right? We all have these ambitions. We all can, you know, we can be able to see the kind of life that you want to live. You know, you have these dreams and desires that you want to accomplish that will give you a better life. In fact, the other day, I don't know how many of us caught this, but there was a 20-year-old who uh, uh, won a $450 million jackpot. Yeah. In the, in the U.S. Now, it was only fair for Lucy and I to dream about the possibility of someone giving us 50 billion Kenya shillings. Can you imagine? Let's say even they tax 50%. Can you imagine if someone today gave you 25 billion Kenya shillings? 
what will you do with 25 billion Kenya shillings? What, what kind of car, or is it cars, will you drive? What kind of house will you live in? What, what, what are some of the things that you, you... Don't you think that people will look at you and see that, you know what? They, 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 they have gained the whole world. In fact, they've been granted opportunities that will give them the entire world. Now, come back. Come back. Ain't nobody giving you 25 billion Kenya shillings. Come back. Are we together? Okay, you can go and daydream later. 25 billion Kenya shillings. But it was fun. If you somehow gain the whole world, what if at the end of that incredible, enviable life that you, you so desire to have, that everybody wanted, that, that, that life that you can't hold on to anyway because it is temporary, what if at the end of that, because in the grand scheme of things, it is temp temporary, what if you gained the whole world but gave away your soul, you forfeited your future, your, your life in eternity? Yes, maybe if you do work hard in this life, you'll be able to enjoy and have the things, all the perks and the benefits that you wanted. But it will come to an end anyway. What if at the end of that awesome life that you envision you will have, where you have everything you could possibly want, and at your deathbed, you suddenly realize, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, I'm about to go into eternity where I forfeited my, my, my soul. I, 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 I have pursued my self-interest instead of God. I have left and I have traded my eternity for the things that I'm about to leave behind at your deathbed. And, and Jesus in that moment said, this is, a, this is a, an amazing question for you to ask yourself. What can, you, what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? At that point of death, at that point of moving on to the next phase or season of your life, what can you exchange? What can you give in exchange for your soul. And we have seen this. We have seen this with people. Some of us have encountered people at their deathbeds and where we've had a conversation with them and they have told you what are the things that should matter in life. If you've spoken to much older people and they will tell you, yes, especially the ones who've had the privilege of enjoying everything that they wanted, they will tell you what the most important things in life should be. Following Jesus will cost you self. And I believe that many of us, if I ask you this question, what can you give in exchange for your soul? We know the answer to that. We know. We'll give it all. We will give it all. And, and here's what those people who've gone before us have discovered. And what we begin to discover today is that your eternal relationship with God is of greater worth than all of your possessions, all of your positions, all of your power. It is of greater value than anyone you may ever know, anyone that you may ever met or even have a relationship with. And I'm telling you guys that that is a remarkable, life-changing, defining moment of discovery for any individual in here today listening to me. Becoming a follower of Jesus is absolutely free. You just need to say yes. You cannot do anything to earn it. But... To remain as a follower of Jesus, to follow Jesus as a lifestyle in this sinful, adulterous generation, it is going to cost you and I. Following Jesus will cost yourself. In other words, at some point in the journey, I'm telling you guys, there's going to be a conflict of interest and you're going to have to make a decision. Beginning even this afternoon, you're going to have to make a decision. In that moment, you'll be required to make a choice because the thing that you feel like you need to do or not do is going to feel like a dilemma. You won't know what to do. You know, it's not going to be something that everybody else needs to stop doing. And we encounter this on a day-to-day -day basis in our offices, in the neighborhood, in the city. We encounter these things. It is not going to be something that everyone else needs to stop doing or start doing. No, it wouldn't even be something that everyone around you seems to agree on. It's not like everyone is going to follow you and because of this is what you're saying. No, 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 no. It will be as if inside of you, your conscience will come alive. There's something in you that will just come alive and, 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 and you know and you can tell yourself, if I'm going to be a follower of Jesus, I, I, I can't go there. I, I, I need to leave this space. If you're going to be a true follower of Jesus, you need to, you need to ensure that yourself is not contradicting with what Jesus is saying. You, you, you know that at that fork on the road, you need to say, I, I, I can't.
can't call him back because I know what that call means. I can't take that job because I know it will make me get into corrupt deals that I don't want. I, I, I need to quit my job because of the things that I've been doing. I need to quit this relationship because that's not what Jesus wants for me. Now, don't get it twisted. I'm not saying that the other person is bad because they are also on their own journey. But it could be that what the two of you are doing is wrong. I can't call that person. I can't take that call. I can't do this. And it's almost as if your conscience will come alive and tell you, I can't. I, you should not do that. Friends, it's not going to be a verse that you will remember and say, yeah, those things are good. Oh, 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 when you come here for worship night or a wonderful prayer season and you're like, wow, the Lord has spoken to me and this is it. Oh, it's not going to be an earth shaking someone that the pastor is going to drop it like his heart. No. It's going to be those moments, that, that, that fork in the road right there where you know, you're just going to know that this is the moment that I have to say no to myself and say yes to Jesus. It's not, oh, what does the Bible say about this thing, about corruption? You will know. You will know deep down inside of you. And for some of us, that moment is now. You know what Jesus is saying to you. He has been speaking to you over and over again and you know what he wants you to do. You know, you know that you need to submit your life to him. But, but yourself has been telling you, oh, it is shameful. Oh, it is not cool. Oh, you still have some unmet desires and you don't want to get into this relationship where now you have to live in the straight and narrow so you need to enjoy your life a bit more. And guys, allow me to say that that's just a bunch of rubbish. Because it, it is so, trusting in yourself, it is so dangerous and detrimental to think that you can trust in yourself when you don't even know what will happen this afternoon. So, so for you to believe that what your body and what yourself is telling you, that's a lie that you're believing in. Because it's only Jesus, it's only God who knows what's going to happen tomorrow. So guys, it is dangerous. It's detrimental for us to trust in self. And that's why following Jesus will have to cost you self. How can you trust in self when the self has no idea who you are and where you're meant to be? We find our identity in Jesus Christ. Following Jesus will have to cost you self. Guys, that's the terms and condition. That's the fine print of this relationship with Jesus. Many of us, we get and engage into this relationship, but we don't really know what's the fine print. The fine print is that you have to give up yourself. And it's not difficult because we say no to ourselves every single day. Some of us, even today, maybe you, you, you need to go and, ha and work and you'll say no to your lunch because you know that I need to do this project because this project is going to catapult me to the next level. So it's not a difficult thing. It sounds like a big theological, spiritual thing to deny ourselves, but it's not because we are doing it in our day-to-day -day lives. So I want to invite us into a time of prayer. And I, I, I don't know what this means to you. I don't know. I don't know whether it's a rebuke like Jesus rebuked Peter. I don't know whether it's a challenge that he has, Jesus, I, I thought that I had died to self but when I think about it, I haven't really because I'm still controlling certain parts of my life. And, and maybe there are some of us who are, you are here and maybe this is your, 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 this is your effort to try and come back into church. And, and I'm, I'm glad you're here because then it begins to give you an idea of what is expected of you when you get to that place because Jesus says and he used a very interesting word he says whoever wants to be my disciple you have to make a choice you have to make a choice so I'm glad that you're here because then you have an opportunity to make a choice 
and trust in the one who knows you. Trust in the one who loves you. Trust in the one who wants to spend eternity with you. So I want you to start by praying for yourself. Guys, I've done my part. I've brought the message to us. Now you need to do your part. Because every time that when Jesus, or most of the time when Jesus spoke to the disciples, there was always a response. When he called the followers, they responded. The disciples, they responded to him by leaving everything and following Jesus. And those are good analogies. And are there areas in your life where you know, I haven't let go. I know that what I'm doing is wrong. Or maybe it's not even wrong. I just know that this is one area where I will find it difficult and I find it difficult to let go and live for Jesus. I want you to begin surrendering that. And, and surrendering, it's, it's not some, some, you know, amorphous thing. It's not that. It's just to say, God, help me. Help me surrender this relationship to you. Not by my might or power, but by your spirit. I can be able to do it. You know. You know. And right there where you're seated, if there's that one thing or that one area, just raise up your hand and I'll pray for us. Raise up your hand as a form of surrender. You're saying, this is, this is it, Lord. It could be my children. I've struggled could be my job I find it difficult it could be my relationship and I'm finding it difficult to let go and just trust in you and father look at these hands that as they go up Lord this is symbolic of the surrender Lord we are surrendering to you in fact if you don't mind just putting both your hands up and just say God I surrender this situation to you mention it to God mention it to God you know you know what it is. God, I surrender. I surrender my job. I surrender my wife. I surrender my husband. I surrender my businesses. I surrender my school. I surrender my provision, oh Lord, to you. I surrender every area of my life. Some of us, we thought that we had died to self, but self still control, controls us greatly. And Lord, I want to surrender myself to you and I pray that would you help me say these words, speak these words to God. And Father, even as these words are going up, oh Lord, I pray that Father, let it be representative of the fact that Lord, we want to surrender everything to you. Lord, this is symbolic of us saying, have your way. Have your way. We are inviting you to come and have your way in our lives. Have your way in our lives, oh Lord. Lead us and guide us, oh Lord where we have struggled. Father, I do pray that you'll give us the courage to do what is right. Give us the courage to do what is right. What we even know. Lord, for some of us, our conscience has died. And Lord, I pray that you'll make it alive. Bring it alive in us, Lord. Oh, Father, sometimes we do even things and we don't even feel guilty because we are so used to doing these things. And Lord, I pray that you'll take us back to where we need to be take us to the place where when we do something wrong Lord we will know that this is not what you desire of us but Lord you desire for us to live a righteous life so Lord revive us give us the courage oh Lord to do what is right give us the courage to trust in you regardless of what situation we face regardless of how difficult our circumstance is and Lord I pray that you will hear the prayers of your people that even as they mention those things to you, Lord, you know their hearts that they will be fully submitted to you. I pray that, Lord, may our hearts be fully submitted to you. As we continue in that mood of prayer, maybe you're there and for you, you know that Christ has spoken to you and you need to surrender your life to him. Just put up your hand and I'll pray for you. Jesus is saying that, you know what? Come follow me. But this, is the, this is the best decision you can ever make. If this is you, just lift up your hand slightly higher. I'll see it and I'll pray for you. Thank you for that hand. 
thank you for that hand. Thank you for that hand. And you're saying, Jesus, I want to surrender my life to you, my all. And I do pray that my words, my heart will follow my words. And if this is you, and those of us who have made this prayer of surrender, I want to invite you to say it together with our brothers and sisters who've raised up their hands. And Lord, I pray that indeed you'll hear their prayer. Say, Heavenly Father, I come before you as a sinner. I confess of my sins to you. And I acknowledge that you died on the cross for me. You are buried and you resurrected, ascended into heaven. And because of that, I have life and have it abundantly. So Lord, take the throne of my life. Have your way in my life. Give me the courage to let go of self and invite you to take over of my life. Lord, lead me in the way everlasting. All for the glory and honor of your name. Father, we celebrate you and we thank you so much for everything that you've done for us and you continue to do for us. Thank you for such an amazing word that we can be able to learn uh, 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 from uh, your word and from your servants. We thank you and we pray all this believing and trusting in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, why don't you give the Lord a round of applause even as you rise to your feet. Just rise to your feet.